Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the podcast, I'd like to share an update on the economy and the stock market. It's been a pretty brutal year for stocks and bonds in the U.S. and across the world, but we may have hit bottom already. I don't know for sure. If you've listened to the show in the past, you know that I don't pretend to speculate on what's going to happen in the next 6 to 18 to 24 months, but things are starting to look a little bit better. Stocks are more reasonably priced. There are economic headwinds, but reasons to be optimistic there as well. So in today's episode, I just wanted to share my perspective on what I see as I'm reading the news and interpreting data and research and so forth, both on the U.S. and global economy and with U.S. stocks, big stocks, small stocks, value and growth stocks. Hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, I need to interject quickly to remind you all that nothing found in today's episode or any other episode of Grow Money Business should be considered financial, investing, legal, tax, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and to deploy on your own terms. And before taking any actions on content found on the show, please do consult with your tax professional, your attorney, or your financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner, head on over to threeoakswealth.com to learn more about what we do in terms of financial planning and investments and how we help clients on an ongoing basis. Okay, so today on on the podcast, I'd like to talk a little bit about whether we've hit the bottom in the stock market. As as you know, it's been uh, a rough year for stocks and bonds, uh, both here in the US and across the world. And a lot of people are wondering whether we're we're gonna be in for some more pain here over the next 12 months or whether we've hit the bottom. I'm not ready to make a call either way. For those of you who've uh, heard me talk about this subject and have listened to the show for any period of time, I'm I'm pretty transparent in that I have no idea what's going to happen in the next 12 months. The stuff is based on humans, and humans make really irrational decisions a lot. So there's there's no way we can be totally certain. But I did want to share my perspective on where we're at as an economy, both uh, in the U.S. and in the world where we're at in terms of stock and bond valuation, and a couple themes I see in the market uh, as we sit here in the fourth quarter of 2022. So why don't we start with the economic stuff? The first thing I want to point out is inflation is obviously still here. Every month, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics comes out with the, the CPI numbers, which are the Consumer, it's the consumer price index. I've explained it on the show in the past. They have these people around the country go assess the cost of a consistent basket of goods and services that people like you and me might buy throughout the month, and they track the cost of that basket of goods year over year. So this is these are the October numbers that that came out a few weeks ago. Um, inflation is still up eight point two percent year over year, and these are these are our basic goods. Uh, food, um, you know, housing, things like that. So the next numbers uh, will not be out until November 10th. 8.2% is down slightly from the previous month, September, where it was 8.3%. So it's it's trending very, very slightly in the right direction. But I think over the next six months, we're going to see this number continue to fall and fall and fall as the Federal Reserve's rate hikes continue to take shape and uh, make their way through the banking and the financial system. We, we've been in this period of rising rates here for a little while, and that's the, we're starting to see the effects in the system. The, the effects are starting to take hold. So one thing I want to point out is, yeah, it's trending down very, very slightly. Inflation is still very high. That being said, inflation expectations are still low. And there's a couple ways that we can assess inflation expectations. One of them is you can go around and poll people, which uh, the government does. The other thing we can do is look at long-term bond yields. Long-term bond yields are a pretty good proxy for inflation expectations because if the market thinks there's going to be persistently high inflation, they're not going to be willing to buy a bond for 4% per year with a term of 25 years because if inflation is going to continue at 8.2% and you think that that's never going to go away, 
you are losing purchasing power by buying a bond that pays you interest of less than 8.2%. You get 4% on, per year on the interest on this bond, but since the cost of stuff that you want to buy is going up at 8.2%, which is greater than 4 you're losing ground on that investment. So if you think that inflation is going to go continue going up at 8.2%, there is absolutely no reason you should buy uh, a bond yielding any less than that. It just flat doesn't make sense. And yields in the bond market are substantially less than 8.2%. Uh, when we look at corporate and treasury yields, they're um, probably half that. You know, depending on the issue that you're looking at, the credit quality of the corporation and so forth. I don't have the number for the 30-year the US T-bond uh, in front of me, but it is substantially less than that. Now, remember that yields are set by supply and demand. And so if everybody in the world or, or every market participant thought that inflation would continue to be high, they would be unwilling to buy a bond for 4% or anything less than their inflation expectations. Therefore, uh, the yields would have to rise in order to meet uh, what investors are demanding. So in other words, inflation expectations are substantially lower than they are now. And that's, and that's good. And the reason is that inflation expectations are, are often called um, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and I'll give you a, a tangible example. Let's say that, that you and I are um, talking about our household budgets. And we think that there's going to be a lot of really, really high inflation. So maybe we think that inflation is actually going to go up. And the prices of um, our maybe our grocery bill, if we think our grocery bill is going to be a lot higher in three months than it is today, then what are you and I going to do? We're probably going to run out and go to Costco and fill our freezer and buy more stuff before the prices go up. But what does that do if everybody in the country, everybody in the world is doing the exact same thing? It's going to increase the demand for goods and services and drive prices up that much faster because inflation is simply too much money chasing around too few goods and services. And so when there is more demand for that same set of goods and services, it drives the price up. That's what inflation is. And if we think as a society that inflation is going to continue to be high and increasing, we're incentivized to run out and buy the stuff that we want before the prices go up. And so it's kind of the self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's why the Federal Reserve spends so much uh, time and energy communicating uh, their policies in a very specific way. They're trying to talk down inflation and communicate and use the tools in their toolbox to uh, uh, pursue sound monetary policy, yes, but they're trying to communicate it in a way that keeps people's inflation expectations down. So right now we're seeing lower bond yields and the polls coming back of people's inflation expectations are a little bit lower. And that's generally a good sign. So inflation is high right now. It looks like it is trending down ever so slightly. And over the next six months, I would expect that trend to, to accelerate. Now, the other thing going on is the jobs, the, the labor market around the country is still very tight. That means that unemployment is low, which is generally a good thing for the economy. Un unemployment, uh, the most recent rate published is about three and a half percent, which is really, really low. And if the Federal Reserve is looking at that, uh, that number and trying to decide, well, what is the current status of the economy? Can we continue to raise interest rates to combat inflation? Is that going to force us into a, into a recession? Well, an unemployment rate of 3.5% would tell them that, well, the labor market's pretty good right now. We think that we can continue to raise rates without jeopardizing the economy. Now, there is, it's a, there's a little bit more to it than that. As I said, inflation expectations are low. Wage growth is also easing too. So wages have been accelerating and, and going up, uh, which is is you know good for workers. It it contributes to inflation. That trend is slowing down with uh, now that inflation is starting to slow down as well. So it is three point five percent. But if I had to uh, put my finger on it, I'd say that it's kind of a weak three point five percent. And going forward, we might see that go up. 
The U.S. dollar is go is very strong and rising. That's another headwind economically. And I, I I don't mean to rattle this off one by one without a whole lot of context. I promise I'll circle back to why this is important and why we care about this stuff. But inflation is high; it's starting to come down just a little bit. Inflate uh, unemployment is low. The jobs market is strong. Seems like that's coming back down to earth a little bit as well. The U.S. dollar is also strong. Because interest rates are going up, that makes the U.S. dollar a more attractive investment globally. So it means that more people around the world are trying to buy U.S. dollars in exchange for whatever currency they have. Because when interest rates are higher here than they, let's say that they're higher in America than they are in New Zealand, and you're and you're an investor in New Zealand, you might want to take your currency in New Zealand and go buy U.S. dollars to put in a bank account in the United States because you can get a better interest rate. So when interest rates go up, that tends to uh, push the value of the U.S. dollar higher. That is another headwind for the economy as a whole, because if you're a big corporation, you're trying to sell goods and services internationally. If the, val- if the value of the U.S. dollar is going up, which is the currency that you're selling your stuff in, that makes that stuff more expensive to international consumers. And so as the value of the U.S. dollar goes up, that makes it a more attractive investment. It continues to push the value up further and further. That's typically kind of a headwind for earnings. The final thing I wanted to comment on is oil prices. Oil is uh, it's still very high. I'm, I'm sure everybody's noticed that gas prices are, are, are still really high, uh, but it's starting to come down. We've got the question a couple times, hey, I heard OPEC decided to cut their production. Does that mean that we'll be in for uh, higher oil prices as a result and maybe greater gas prices after, after that? Not necessarily. So OPEC, as you know, is the um, cartel based in the Middle East of oil producing uh, exporting countries. That's the acronym OPEC. And they make a decision uh, collaboratively. It's kind of, it's not that collaborative. Um, Saudi Arabia is basically pulling the strings, but they make it the decision as a group of how much oil to produce in order to maximize their own profits in the global marketplace. So based on where uh, the price of oil internationally is, and based on what's going on in the world economy, OPEC meets and they make a decision of how much oil to pull out of the ground to meet demand and to um, the, the maximize their economic well-being as, as a country, basically. So <clears throat> OPEC recently cut their production. And back to your old you know, economics 101 supply and demand curve, if the supply of oil goes down, you would think that the price would go up. These days, OPEC is not really the driver of the oil market. OPEC more uh, more often follows what the oil market is doing. And so th- they have seen a weakening in uh, global demand. There have been a couple of big reports that have uh, reported that demand for oil is down a little bit and they think will continue to be down through the end of the year. That's the main reason that OPEC cut. So the prices were down, OPEC cut. That reduction in supply is not great enough in the global market to drive up oil prices. The other thing on top of that is when, when OPEC cuts, that's their, that's their projected output. Their actual output is always a little bit different than their projected output. So I, I wouldn't rush to the conclusion that OPEC's producing a little bit less oil or, or, or they've uh, decided to produce a little bit less oil. Therefore, we're going to have all these supply constraints and it's going to jack up the price of oil and the price of gas um, uh, in a directly related way. I don't think it's that cut and dry. Now, that being said, the themes we have uh, from an economic standpoint are are that in the U.S. and and across the world, we do have some headwinds, okay? Unemployment is very low. That's good. Seems like that number is going up just a touch. Wage growth is starting to slow down, as I said. So the jobs market is strong, but it's weakening a little bit. The U.S. dollar is rising. That's another slight headwind. Inflation is high, as we know, but it's starting to taper a little bit as well. So 
will this drive us into a recession or not? We, we, we simply don't know. But what we really care about are asset prices. And I want to remind everyone that even if we fall into a recession uh, or, or we have a, uh, maybe the next 12, 18, 24 months, we find ourselves in a recession, maybe a little longer than everybody expected, asset prices today reflect all the information that is available uh, to investors. And this possibility that we fall into a prolonged recession is already priced into the markets. That's just, that's just how it, it works. And you can argue that there is an argument against that. What I'm saying is, is uh, related to the efficient markets hypothesis. And that's that all the publicly available uh, information is baked into the prices of assets around the world. If you don't think the markets are efficient, then you'd say that the information available to us is not accurately reflected in the pricing. And therefore, I can use that information to make an investment decision to my advantage. My philosophy after doing this for a long time and working on and managing a trading desk and being really intimately involved in it is that markets are definitely not perfectly efficient. But for the most part, they really are quite efficient. And for investors like you and me, who probably ought to be buying diversified funds instead of you know, making huge portfolio decisions on, on individual securities, the efficient markets hypothesis is largely accurate enough for, for us to use. And so therefore, it's safe to say that every piece of data that comes out on inflation and jobs and interest rates and oil and, and all this stuff is reflected in the prices of securities that we might invest in. Which brings me to the next point. Stocks are starting to look a little bit more attractive. Six months ago, everything looked uh, pretty expensive still. And that's still not a good reason if you have cash to invest to hold off on investing that cash, wait for a better time to enter the market. It's a good reason to maybe dollar cost average into it over a period of time, which I'll explain here in a few minutes. But six months ago, at the beginning of the year, you know, we we, we entered this uh, downtrend in the markets, and you know, March, April ish, it, it didn't seem like an attract a, a terribly attractive time to enter. Now everything is starting to look quite a bit more reasonable, and um, there. Are, I think some sectors of the market are beginning to become undervalued. Now, the way that we, one of the ways that we evaluate that is based on valuation. Valuation has to do with how expensive are these investments that I might purchase. The, the most popular valuation tool that we have for stocks is called PE ratio, which you may have heard of. And so if you take like Coca-Cola, for example, and you look at the price at which a share of Coca-Cola trades and you divide it by the earnings per share for Coke, that ratio is is called the P.E. ratio, price to earnings. And so if a P.E. ratio is high, that means that the stock is expensive because the earnings that you're entitled to by owning one share cost more money. If the P.E. ratio is low, that means that it's uh, more reasonably priced. It could be undervalued. Now, all sorts of different stocks have different um, you know, reasons that they might have a high or low P.E. ratio. Growth stocks are higher P.E. ratio securities because growth stocks are usually tech companies. They're more innovative. They're driving uh, larger revenue and profit growth. They have more of a potential upside long term. So therefore, investors are willing to pay more for that kind of opportunity. And therefore that drives up the PE ratio a little bit. You look at a company, Coca-Cola is a classic example of a value stock that's not as innovative. It's not going to grow revenues or profits as fast, but it's a cash cow that's been around for a long time and is very stable. And even though they're not going to drive massive revenue growth in the future because of the, you know, some new technology or process or service, you know, the, the, recipe for Coke's been around for a long time. It hasn't really changed much. The PE ratio for Coke is likely to be lower. And so if you're buying Coke, you're buying it because 
that earnings stream, which you have a little bit more confidence in likely, is inexpensive. But if you're buying Amazon, which is a growth company, you're buying it because you think that the revenue and profit growth will continue to be very high. Now, PE ratio is not the only valuation measure we have. We can also look to price to sales, price to book value of equity, price to um, enterprise value. That's another one that, that's pretty popular. If you, if, if you think of a company's income statement, you have sales and revenue at the top. You have all the expenses underneath that. And then you have earnings and profits down at the bottom. So if you take PE ratio, that's price divided by the earnings that the share produces. The earnings is are, are, are at the bottom of the income statement and are subject to uh, accounting gimmicks. They might not be accurate in terms of uh, cash flow measure. So some companies have a whole lot of earnings on paper, but they don't actually have a lot of cash flow. And that can be uh, challenging for financing reasons. And so we, we kind of like to look at a number of these different measures to get an accurate representation of valuation. Price to sales is another valuation measure that we like to look at because it's not really subject to as many accounting gimmicks because sales are very cut and dry. This is right at the very top of your income statement. It's before any, you know, expense recognition or depreciation or amortization or, you know, any, any um, paper profits that CFOs and accountants like to um, mess with to spit out more earnings at the bottom. So price to sales doesn't include our expenses. If expenses go way up and it hurts earnings, that's not going to be reflected in price to sales, but it's another good measure. I like to look at enterprise price to, to enterprise value as well. Enterprise value is the total um, amount of debt and equity that a company has. And the reason that we like to look at that is it's also less subject to accounting maneuvers. And it kind of baselines and gives you a consistent data set company to com company. So there, th those are a few measures we like to look at. Now, these, these can all be uh, used either for um, to evaluate a specific company or to evaluate a group of companies. I like to look at this in our financial planning firm as a group. I don't care so much about the individual companies unless there's maybe a client works for one and they have a whole bunch of stock in one for whatever reason, then we'll look at it. But for the most part, I like to look at different sectors of the market. Growth stocks as a group, value stocks as a group, large companies, small companies as, as a group, and evaluate the PE ratio and the other measures compared to their long-term averages. So I, the reason I the reason that I care about this right now is that stocks have been really, really highly valued based on these valuation measures for the last ten years or so, and part of the reason is that we've been in this low interest rate environment for a long time. We came out of the mortgage crisis, Federal Reserve pushed interest rates down to zero, then they went through quantitative easing, and had, we had this really easy monetary policy for a long time. And one of the things that we're seeing right now is that there's renewed competition for, for investment dollars with interest rates a little higher. And here's what I mean by that. Back when, let's say 2014, when interest rates were uh, basically 0%, if you were an investor, either an individual like you and me, or an organization, or a pension fund, or an endowment, any kind of investor, you want returns on your invested dollars. And so you, you have a choice, right? You can buy real estate, you can buy stocks, you can buy bonds. Well, you don't really want to buy bonds in that environment because they're not returning you anything. You, you, have, you have no net yield, no real yield in, in bonds in, in that environment uh, when you're getting 0% interest. And so that pushed a lot of investable assets into risk assets like stocks when really they would have preferred to be in bonds, but it didn't make sense because the yields were so low. And so that there was just very little stocks had very little competition 
in the marketplace for invested dollars is what I'm getting at. And it pushed valuations up, right? If you have an extra thousand bucks you want to invest, you're trying to make a decision where, where to put it. Well, for a lot of people, stocks were the only game in town. And even though you might not want to take the risk in stocks, there, 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 there were just no other reasonable options for you. More demand pushed stock prices higher and their multiples went up. Their valuations, the price to equity, price to sales, price to book value of equity, they, they, they all went up. Now we're in a slightly different environment. Interest rates are going up thanks to inflation like we've talked about. Stocks have more competition. New dollars coming into the market can put them into uh, a brokered CD that's going to yield 35 or 4% per year. You can go open an account at Ally in a high yield savings account and earn pretty close to 2.5% per year. So for conservative investors or people who are looking for yield, you don't necessarily have to go into the stock market any longer. And that competition is part of the reason I think that these multiples, these, these valuation measures are starting to come down. Now, obviously, we've had a fall. Uh, stocks in general have fallen uh, big time this year. They're, they're down between you know, 20 25%. That's part of the reason. Interest rates going up are you know, number one. They're a headwind on the economy because it makes the U.S. dollar stronger, like we're talking about. It makes operations and financing more expensive for corporations, which tends to hurt earnings and stock prices. It impacts the jobs market. It has all these, these trickle-down uh, impacts. But as we look at things now, be, because of the interest rates going up, now stocks are starting to look a little bit more reasonable, especially small cap issues. So the long-term average for the S&P 500, um, the long-term average PE ratio is around 20, I want to say. Right now, it's slightly less than that. It's only 18. Small cap stocks, the PE ratio is around 10 and a half. Those are starting to look pretty reasonable. And you know the the question for today's episode is: Have we seen the bottom yet? Um, you know, cop out answer: I don't know definitively, of course. But if you have a long time horizon, five or ten years, small cap stocks stocks are starting to look pretty affordable uh, from my perspective. Now, as as always, we don't like to play this game of when's the right time to enter. Um, I, I think if you're really concerned about where the market is, then dollar cost averaging is a really good option. Meaning that if you have um, $120,000 to invest, rather than putting $120,000 into the market all at once, you could space those out maybe $20,000 a month over the next six months. And therefore, if the market crashes in the next six months, you won't have uh, that entire 120,000 at risk, you can space out your investments uh, over time, and uh, it's it's just a really helpful risk management tool for people who don't have the capacity to to weather a market downturn. Now, that being said, things are starting to look cheaper. We may have hit the bottom already. I, I really don't know, but stocks over the last week or so have been up substantially. We're in earnings season right now, meaning that. Uh, companies are in the period where they report their quarterly earnings and the early reports have come back pretty positive. So I, as we sit here now, my expectation is that interest rates are going to continue going up for the next six months. But I do think that the inflation numbers are going to come down pretty soon and uh, things might start to normalize. Now, how quickly we drop rates after that is... Uh, a question for another day. Will this force us into a, a hardcore recession? I don't know. I think the Fed is very concerned about that and they're taking all the steps that they have within their power. Or they're, they're using all the tools that they can get their hands on to combat inflation without driving us into, into a recession. But if they have to put us into a recession, they will because again, prices uh, and inflation is the most important thing that they have to worry about. So that's that's it for today. We we, we may have hit the bottom. But I really don't know. Uh, we, we do have some economic headwinds, but things are starting to look a lot 
uh, rosier, particularly with the cost of assets that we can purchase right now. Stocks, you know, may not necessarily rebound as quickly. You know, we shouldn't expect we shouldn't expect things to bounce back and jump back up to you know a twenty five or thirty PE ratio f- for the S and P five hundred um, anytime soon because we do have the competition uh, in a higher rate environment, but things are starting to look a lot more reasonably priced. And I feel a lot better about entering today than I did uh, six months ago. All right. Hope this was helpful and hope I didn't ramble too much. Uh, I will talk to you all again soon. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.